Good evening, everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Mayur for inviting me for this talk. The topic of my talk is demystifying gender concepts. So I will be talking about the basics of the gender concepts and a little bit about the treatment of gender incongruence. Now, when we talk about Indian society, most of our people are actually aware of two genders. That is, one is male and one is female. We know that our country has recognized a third gender, that is, a transgender, but still it's the female gender. Now, though we say that our country, the people are still not aware, but if you see our society or our culture, the non-binary gender expression people have played important roles for long, for more, many more years before it has gone to the Western societies. So we know that there are a lot of concepts and a lot of terminologies which are being used. One terminology which is very common is like hijra. Now we know that hijras, they normally were supposed to perform the ritual roles. They were supposed to give blessings and to the newborn. But actually, these hijras are either the new, the male who were castrated or there were few who were born with intersex variations and they were added into their community. They are known with different names in different societies or in different states of India. If you see like some of the community, transgender communities prefer to call themselves kinaras, they uh, some, they are symbol of beauty. Some of the, them would like to call them hijras. So we have different terminologies which are being used in different states. But when we come to the scientific part of it, we need to understand that this is the gender unicorn. So we have one concept of gender identity, where the pe person identifies as female or woman or a girl or a male or a man or a boy or the other gender. Then there is a gender expression. That means how that person expresses himself or herself. That is a feminine gender or a masculine gender or others. Then there is another thing which is a sex assigned at birth, whether the child is assigned as a female sex or a male sex or any other or the intersex. Then there is one more concept that how to whom the person is physically attracted to, whether they are attracted to women, whether they are attracted to men or whether they are attracted to the other gender. Then there is also a concept of uh, to whom they are emotionally attracted to, whether to women or to men or to other genders or to both. So a lot of uh, uh, science has been studied about it. A lot of uh, concepts are now clear about it. And that is why the International Endocrine Society has the guidelines for gender incongruent persons. And we have the typical guidelines about how to go about it. Now, if you see just the basic terminologies, so let us first have a basic concept of the terminologies. One is the biological sex or the biological male or the female. Now, what it refers to, these basically means like physical aspects of maleness and femaleness. Like if person is XY chromosome may have female appearing genitalia. So this may not be in line with it. Or the term biological sex and biological male or female are imprecise and that's why we have to avoid. So sometimes we say biological male. Biological male means if suppose somebody has XY. But they may have a female appearing genitalia. So, so there is confusion in that term. So that's why these type of terminologies are not to be used. When we say cisgender, cisgender, this doesn't mean that patient is transgender. This means the patient is not transgender. This means a normal person. Means those who are non-transgender. That is what is called a cisgender. Then we have another terminology, which is the gender dysphoria, which we say that this is a distress, which is experienced if the gender identity and the designated gender are non congruent so this is what we call as a gender dysphoria. Now we know that now we also have the term of gender incongruence, which I'll be talking about. Now gender expression is another terminology and this refers to the external manifestation of gender. Like what is the name of the person, pronouns what we are using, he or she, or clothing, how they are wearing, what haircut they are keeping, how is the behavior, voice or body characteristics, how their mannerisms are. And most of the times you will see that the transgender people will try to align this with their gender identity rather than with their designated gender at birth. So if a, there's a transgender female, she will try to behave like a female. If it's a transgender male, he'll try to behave like a male. So that is how is the gender expression. So what is gender identity? Identity is an individual's felt sense of their identity being, being a masculine or a feminine or a combination or none of these. Expression is how an individual behaves or interacts with others, dresses or displays their gender identity to others. Gender norms. Now, there are some gender norms by the society. How an individual will behave and express their gender. Like both male and female are supposed to behave in some particular way in the society. So if they 
are born as female they are supposed to stereotypically behave like a feminine way born as a male is supposed to behave like in a masculine way so these are the gender norms which are decided by the society there's another very important terminology which is gender fluid or non binary this describes individuals who neither identify themselves as male or female because a lot of clients will come to us and they'll say i am non binary or i am gender fluid so this means they fluctuate between the two poles or they are on a continuum and they feel parts of each to identify as a third unnamed gender but they are neither uh, trying to tell that they are males neither they say they are females a gender means they don't identify themselves as any gender so they say that that we are that that terminology is less used by our clients but mostly they will say we are non binary or gender fluid so basically gender there is a terminology of gender identity or expression then there is gender identity disorder and there is gender incongruence so when we talk about the gender identity this is one's internal deeply held sense of gender so like for some people their gender identity does not fit neatly into that what they actually feel like so gender i expression which is another set of the thing that how they express themselves gender identity is actually not visible to others so like they have may have a gender identity of a man or a woman or a boy or a girl but their the identity those like it does not fit neatly in one of those two choices but if you talk about gender identity disorder we know that when we used to use the term gender identity disorder then we were using the term gender dysphoria but now we use the term gender incongruence so finally now what we use for most of our clients is the gender incongruence now because this encompasses most of the things so we say this is an umbrella term which is used when the gender identity or the gender expression differs from what is typically associated with the gender which is a designated gender gender incongruence is definitely the proposed name of the gender identity related dis, uh, diagnosis and all patients who have incongruence may not have dysphoria they may have incongruence so they may not be like what feel what their assigned gender is or they may not be feeling like that but they may have dysphoria they may be feeling uncomfortable they may not be feeling uncomfortable so then we have the term of gender reassignment therapy gender reassignment surgery these are the terms used when we give them therapy to help them change to the gender they are comfortable with this is called also called as gender confirming or gender affirming treatment gender reassignment surgery means when we are doing the surgeries for the surgical uh, change in the patient's genitalia so that we call it as a gender confirming or the gender affirming surgeries gender role now gender role means behavior attitude and personality trait that the society designates so like i told you they may expect a lady to behave particularly in a feminine way they may expect a man to behave in a masculine way so this is what the society says that this is a typical societal role of a man and woman and if it is something different from them the society may sometimes not agree to that gender role so these are the basic terminologies i have discussed most of it like some age gender people say they have no gender bisexual means that sexual orientation that describes a person who is emotionally and sexually attracted to people of their own gender and people of other genders as well and then we have the cisgender means that the sense uh, what is the gender identity and the assigned sex at birth correspond that is patient is not a transgender and gay person is a sexual orientation that describes a person who is emotionally and sexually attracted to people of their own gender it can be used regardless of the gender identity but most commonly it is used to describe men then gender identity is a personal person's internal sense of being a man or a woman or neither or another gender that is identity which is internal sense it is not external you cannot judge it from outside how the person feels internally non conforming means expressing a gender that differs from a given society norm for male or females and then we have the queer queer means is an umbrella term which is used by some people who think of their sexual orientation or gender identity as outside of societal norms some people view the term as more fluid and inclusive than traditional categories for sexual orientation and gender identity so that is a queer group due to his history as a derogatory term it is not embraced or used by all members of the lgbt community so some of the clients themselves use it but most of the time they will avoid using it and when we talk about transgender it actually means a person whose gender identity and the assigned sex at birth do not correspond so it is used as an umbrella term to include gender identities outside of the male and the female that is what we use it the word transgender pan gender means a person whose gender identity compromises many comprises of many genders so they have the gender identity which is 
like they may be like uh, male female transgender all sorts pansexual means a sexual orientation that describes a person who is emotionally and sexually attracted to people regardless of the gender so these are the basic terminologies there are lots of terminologies but if we understand this this is this is going to help us to understand the treatment of our patients so there are another two terminologies which are very important what is the trans man or the transgender man that is the female to male so a transgender person whose gender, gender identity is male but the patient is actually born as a genetic female that is a transgender male a trans woman or a transgender female is a gender transgender whose gender identity is female but she was born like as a male so though she was born as a male but she identifies herself as a female so that is a transgender female so we know that when we talk about gender dysphoria or now we use the terminology gender incongruence but all incongruence patients may not have dysphoria people have tried to study this this was a very interesting data where they tried to see the third order concepts so they were trying to see the distress due to the dissonance or of the assigned and the experienced gender so they were trying to see body dysphoria patients may have gender distress they may have conflict of body and gender they may have confusion they may have denial and suppression so sometimes they have denial of their transgender identity they don't want to come out in the open because of many reasons the society may not accept it the family may not accept it and many patients who come to us have body dysphoria they don't want a body hair like in a uh, male to female they may not like the beard they may not like the hair body hair so they may want to remove them or if it is a female to male they may be not comfortable with their periods so it is like patients may not have been comfortable with the with the thing which they are having and there is a conflict of body and gender and they are confused what's happening then there is another entity called as interface of assigned gender gender identity and society so this is distress due to misgendering and inability to pass a blend would likely be associated with general disappointment like feeling sad or for some even suicidal ideations are there a lot of patients who tell us that when we were not treated before that we had actually gone to commit suicide so these are the types of uh, things they tell us so that's why it's known also that they may have more of suicidal ideations more of suicides and even after treatment it has been seen that the suicide rate is higher in transgenders then there may be a mismatch between the gender identity and the societal expectations conflict is always there this is a very common problem then there is negative social consequences of gender identity like isolation they may say oh he is a transgender this or she is a transgender we will not be friends with this person people don't want to give them houses one of my transgender clients was asked to vacate overnight the house because it, she was a transgender so these are the things people do have in their minds and that that these are the problems they face internal processing of rejection and transphobia so they fear rejection sadness they fear how the people will feel like in the college the friends may stop talking to them parents may tell their children not to talk to them there is hyper vigilance for transphobia and uh, internalized transphobia this is one's own body might not uh, might become persecutory uh and for some transgender individuals who feel themselves constantly looked by others so they feel that the people are watching them only they are thinking about them because they are undergoing this change they are being looked at so all these things are there so how to approach how to help our clients the best so we have a diagnostic criteria for gender dysphoria in adolescents and adults we have a mark incongruence in one's experience and the expressed gender which has to be done by the psychiatrist and the natal gender for at least 6 months in duration with at least two of the following that is a marked incongruence between the expressed or the experienced gender and the primary or the secondary uh, sexual characters and also we know that they have they should have a strong desire to get rid of one's primary or secondary sexual characters because of the incongruence and they want to have the secondary sexual characters of the other gender so which we have to see that they are not having any other personality disorder they are not having any other psychiatric disorder which may be looking like this that is why a psychiatrist is important to uh, see that they are not having any other reason for this but it is primarily a gender dysphoria only it's not not that the patient is having some other personality disorder and they are just imagining that then we also have uh, diagnostic criteria for gender dysphoria in children but in our country at the moment for children there are no specific guidelines so most of us like i don't treat kids or children below 18 years i only treat them up after 18 years because as of now we don't have the clear cut guidelines for treatment of children with gender dysphoria 
But in case we have to treat a child, only thing we can do is with the parental consent and the assent from the child is to give puberty blockers. That's the only thing which is which is there. But at the moment, most of us like are treating uh, adults who are more than the age of 18. But when we talk about children, we also know that children may not be persisters. So many of the children who have gender dysphoria in childhood may actually grow up and may not have gender dysphoria later. That is why we don't have to do any sort of irreversible treatment in them. If at the children are to be treated, they are only to be given puberty blockers. Because the thing is that in case they grow up and they don't persist with the gender dysphoria, we are not supposed to do any of the treatment which is irreversible for them. So when we talk about children, it's a strong desire to be of the other gender, preference for wearing the clothes of the opposite gender, to play for playmates of the other gender, to strong preference for cross-gender roles, for toys, and a strong dislike of the one's own sexual anatomy and the physical characteristics that don't, don't match with the patient's gender at the moment, but they want it for the experienced gender. So children must meet six of the uh, criteria in addition to having distress or impaired functioning lasting for at least six months. So it's, it's a very strict criteria. Now, whenever we talk about the goals of hormonal therapy, now we have basically what we are trying to do. If we are trying to do, suppose, trans uh, males. So if we have trans males, means it is from female to male. So what we have to do is we have to reduce the female hormone level and we have to give the external hormones to of the designated gender. So we have to reduce the endogenous sex hormone levels and reduce the secondary sex characters of the individual's designated gender. And so basically what we are doing is we are giving the sex hormones which are consistent with the individual's preferred gender identity. That is what we call as the cross sex hormones. And we have to use the principle of hormone replacement which we use for hypogonadal patients. So we are actually trying to bring their levels to the normal level of a male. So if we are having a trans male means we are going from female to male. So what we are trying to do is we are going to build up their testosterone levels to the level of a normal male and we are going to reduce their female hormone level to the level of a normal uh, male which is like which should be low only. And very important is the medical provider should be knowledgeable but that's not the only criteria. The other caregivers should also be knowledgeable. They should know how to talk to the patient, how to make them understand. They should not be looked upon as somebody who has come to your OPD, who is something to be looked upon, looked down, or you just have to make them sit separately. That should never be done. And we should also see the mental health concerns. So in between, like once we have a psychiatry reference done and we have made a diagnosis that there is nothing else which is causing the incongruence, it's just gender incongruence. Even then in between, it's always a wise thing to have a psychiatry opinion if you're feeling that your client is getting some mental health issues because hormonal therapy per se can also aggravate the mental issues and they may be going through a lot of distress because of the family being not supportive and many reasons might be there. So we also have to have people around you who know how to talk to them and take care of them. So we need to have a very, very strict criteria for hormone therapy and the persons like I said, we treat more than 18 years they should be able to consent for treatment. Consent is very, very important. Patient has to sign a consent. We have to talk about their fertility options for future because we know that patients need to be very clear that their fertility will be compromised. So they might not want to go for ovum banking in a female to male that is trans male or for sperm banking in a male to female that is trans female. So we need to talk to them at the beginning of the starting of therapy about that very clearly. And we have to tell them what is going to happen to their body, what are the changes which are going to happen and it's going to take time, we are going to go slow and we are going to monitor them for any side effects which are recommended as per the guidelines. So we know that we have like a lot of other ways to see there is one of the this gender dysphoria scores where we have the different response categories for a female to male version it is and this is for male to female version so these type of scores are used for adolescents where they try to see whether it is actually gender dysphoria or it is not but in our country unfortunately the scenario is a little bit different this is our data from our center where we have like uh, this we published last year. We took around 43 female to male and uh, 46 male to female. And what we have seen is they have come to us only after the age of 25 to 26 when they have become self-sufficient to earn. And if they are deserted by their families, they don't have problems to support themselves. Most of them have not 
been able to go far further with their education because of multiple factors one major reason being that uh, they were not very much supported by their peer group most of them were doing good jobs because whatever clientele we have are from companies and from i tech companies also so they are doing good jobs but many of them have left education before 12th standard and uh, the family support system was also abysmally poor that is a very very unfortunate thing but in my personal experience i have seen in the past 14 years ever since i've been working with transgender population i have seen that the family support has been increasingly improving and now more and more parents are coming with their children to help them so that is a very good change which is happening in our country because parents are getting educated they are getting the information and they are actually trying to help their kids and many of my transgender clients are now staying with their parents which is a very good thing because that helps for their mental health as well so the different things in our country are they present at later age most of the time when kids are brought to us the parents don't want us to do any therapy they just want us to make them not undergo the trans transition later and as i told that children can be persisters or they may not have dysphoria after adulthood so we don't have to give any irreversible treatment to them ever till they reach the age of 18 and are ready to give the consent there is lack of information still in our country and many of our clients do go to quacks for surgery follow up is very difficult it's intermittent they don't come for hormone therapy even after taking uh, the hormone therapy for some time they default or they do surgeries they get orchidectomy done they get the hysterectomies done they get the oophorectomies done but they don't come for follow up and they come with poor bone health many of them are not educated but few of them are good they are working tech companies few of them are doctors as well and they are doing pretty well in their in their career family support as i told you it's changing the scenario is changing now many of my clients have a good family support system this is one of our own society guidelines we have come up with a consensus statement on medical management of adult gender incongruent individuals who were seeking gender reaffirmation as female and now we are going to soon come up with the male for the males as well so initial evaluation should include a detailed personal and family medical history we should see for any past history any disease any cardiovascular illness liver problems or any thrombotic disease because all these are very very important not to forget substance abuse and psychiatric illnesses and fertility desire which is the most important thing which i told you should be always discussed at every visit till they go for the surgery because if they do the surgeries after the uh, sex reassignment surgery then they won't be able to go for this and later on they should not regret medications we should always know because what happens many a time they may not tell you and they might be taking off level medication they may be taking overdose of the medication to see fast effects so we should always ask that question examination we have to examine our patient we have to see that there is nothing else because many a times there may be some dsds who may be they are labeled as gender incongruence but they may not be gender incongruence so a karyotype is recommended we have to do a genital examination we are supposed to see uh, with their permission for sure because all these things are very important otherwise sometimes we there may be other dsds which may be thinking as uh, gender incongruence but there may be some other reason so all these things are very important before we start giving them any any therapy so these are the physical effects which happens in female to male when they transit from female to male they get a deepening of the voice clitoral enlargement happens they have facial hair growth their period stops after five six shots of the testosterone injections their breast tissue atrophies and they have a decreased percentage of body fat compared to muscle mass and when we have a male to female transition we see that there will be some amount of breast growth sometimes they may not be very comfortable with that and they may want to go for implants later they will have de decreased erectile function this has to be told because many a times many of the male to female may not want this uh, side effect and this has to be told because this is going to happen when we give them estrogens and give them testosterone redu reducing blockers or testosterone reduce uh, like luprolide and all to reduce the testosterone levels they may have they'll have decreased testicular size they'll have increased body fat compared to the muscle mass so the take home is first thing is diagnosis don't think that everybody who is walking into a clinic is a gender incongruence take a psychiatry opinion examine your patients do all the blood test because sometimes you may have dsds who may be walking to your clinic as gender incongruence i had a patient with klein felters who came as gender incongruence so there may be lots of surprises and we have to treat the basic pathology first and then see whether they still persist with the gender incongruence because then that becomes a separate diagnosis in itself 
Understanding the issues is very important. We have to see what, what the patient has come to you. Sometimes they come to us and they say that they don't want therapy. They have just come to ask and inquire and they want to know what can be done. And they want to know that can I live like that? I don't want to take any hormones. I don't want to do any surgery. I just want to cross dress. So that's fair enough. We don't have to start hormones for everyone. But if the patient has already done oophorectomy, uh, hysterectomy, or they have done orchidectomy and they are devoid of hormones, then we have to give them mostly cross-sex for many of their cardiovascular, metabolic, and bone health. Social and family support is paramount. So social support is important. Support from your clinic staff is very important. And the way we talk to them is very, very important. And we have to see to it that the family supports them. I always make it a point to call the fam family members and talk to them, even if they are not very supported. Many times we try to explain them, tell them that there are fertility preservation options, because this is a major thing in many people's mind when their children go for it, that we can preserve their fertility. We can do the ovum banking. We can do the sperm banking. So they sometimes agree to it and the things become better for the patient. So I think with this I end and any questions I'll be happy to answer. Thank you.